Revelation chapter 2. So let me just give a quick introduction. So last week I preached through Revelation chapter 1. If you're listening uh, or watching by live stream and or if you're a guest this morning, and if you want to get a hold of that, it's no big, no big deal. Just go to my website, carlgallops.com, and there's a whole playlist of past messages. And then uh, that one, Revelation 1, is still up there right as you open the page. You'll see it. Um, it's not necessary that you heard that one in order to understand this completely, but we're going to move along. Also, I said that that um, Sunday, last Sunday, that what I was going to do for a few Sundays is to preach the first seven chapters of Revelation, okay? And there's a really powerful reason when we get to chapter six and seven, you'll see why I'm going to stop right there. Now, in case you want more, that's easy. I preached all through the book of Revelation or taught through it in this sanctuary on Sunday night back during the COVID days. And there are 27 sessions of the whole book of the 22 chapters of Revelation and, and more. I mean, I, I, I give some introduction material about the whole thing of tribulation and rapture and all the different views and where I stand and where I believe the Word of God stands and why. All of that is there as well. It might surprise you. It might shock you if you think, well, we know it's the same place. Well, just you might want to check it out. Revelation. But the way to get there is just go to my website, carlgalves.com backslash rev, R-E-V for Revelation, and you'll see it. Plus there are um, links big block picture links that say the pastor's revelation study. So you can go there. It's an MP3 format. It's not video. It's audio. So you can listen to it anywhere you are, in your car, on a trip, or around the house, or while you're cooking dinner, or whatever. Just relaxing with a cup of coffee. You can get into it, get your Bible, and uh, be prepared. But in the meantime, so what I'm doing, I'm not just going back repeating all of that. Most of you know I don't keep a bunch of notes. I don't stand up here and read to you and preach notes. So a lot of it is fresh as the Holy Spirit leads me. And, and uh, as I've been teaching and preaching this and the whole word of God for a long, long time. So we're going to start with chapter two this morning, but first we will begin with the last couple of verses of chapter one, because it gives some context. And then I will say that we will be at the first few verses of chapter two, dealing with the topic, the subtitle, probably in most of your Bibles, the church at Ephesus. And I'll explain all this in a moment. Now, please understand, we will set some context. We'll put some historical context, some biblical context that is essential. It's crucial to the understanding of the whole book of Revelation and particularly what we're going to talk about this morning. So we'll put context there. So it'll be There'll be a time in this when it'll kind of feel like you're in a Bible class, a seminary class or something, but, but don't worry about that because as we move through, it's going to come alive, not only to the church family and to churches that are listening this morning, but also to individuals, to you, to your heart, to my heart. Every time I preach and teach this, the Lord speaks directly to me and I, and I pray that he does to you as well. I pray that it'll be made very personal, very relevant to you. So we will start, uh, excuse me, boy, my voice cracked. I'm 13 again. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 19. Mm. Write, therefore, what you have seen. This is the Lord speaking to John, who's on the island of Patmos in a in a prison camp island. He's been banished there because he refused to worship the emperor Domitian. In a place of worship, at a time of worship, decreed by that emperor. He was the pastor of the church at Ephesus in that area and also kind of a bishop to all of the churches, all seven churches here. He's elderly by now and he's in seclusion on the island of Patmos. Here's the voice of thunder behind him. It sounds like trumpets at first. He turns around and it is the Lord standing among lampstands. And it says in his hand, holding a star. Well, now we know that this, there's some imagery here because a star is a sun. <laughs> you know, So he's not literally holding a star, but he's going to tell us what those lampstands represent that he saw and what those shining orbs that he had in his hand and around him were. Chapter 1, verse 19 says, Write, therefore, what you have seen. You write down what, it, what is now and what will take place later. The whole book of Revelation is kind of divided that way. 
the first few chapters, were right in John's day. They could have been said, what is now? What I'm experiencing now, what I'm seeing now, what I'm living now. He writes seven letters to seven churches. Those seven churches are real churches that truly existed in that day. And the message for them was real. But the, the fact that there are seven indicates there's something complete and perfect about it. The number seven means that from the opening verse of, of Genesis 1.1, and I've preached all on that before, all the way through to the book of Revelation. The number seven is heard over and over and over. Seven angels, seven churches, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven, 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 seven thunders, seven voices, the sevenfold spirit of God. The number seven is significant. It means holy, perfect, complete. There's a message here for the churches of God for all time. And the churches don't mean denominations and buildings. It means for the people of God who belong to him, who are under the blood of Jesus Christ. The word church, that's an English word, and it comes out of old English. And I don't want to give you, you know, a great big lesson on, on language on that. But it goes all the way back to the Greek word. It doesn't sound anything like the word church, but it comes from the Greek word. If you're in the New Testament and you, you see the word church in English, right underneath it in Greek, the word that's translated is ekklesia. And ekklesia doesn't mean what we think when we say church, a building, or a denomination. Yes, I belong to the church. Where? Well, to Hickory Hammock. No, 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 no. You, you are a part of the church, and you happen to worship at a place called Hickory Hammock. Because ecclesia means the called out ones. That's what it means. It's not about a building. It's not even about a denomination. So if you're under the blood of Jesus Christ, you followed him in believer's baptism. You speak his name. You've given your life and your heart to him, repented of your sin before him. Revelation, I mean, excuse me, Romans 9, ch chapter 10, verse 9. If we would confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and the believe in our heart, that means believe with your life, by your actions, by your mind, by your desires. Believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. If that's you, then you are a part of the ecclesia. You choose to worship here this morning, and I praise God. I always enjoy worshiping with you. But we can worship really anywhere, anytime. The Bible also says though, there's a special blessing, though, when we unite together with fellow believers, always. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us, do not give up the assembling of yourselves together, as so many are in the habit of doing. That was back in the Roman persecution. And the Word of God says, don't quit meeting together. And he says, especially, even more so, as you see the day of evil approaching. Doesn't matter. You say, well, the world's getting so wicked, I don't want to go to church. What? The world's so get, getting so wicked, I need to be in church. I need to be under the Word. I need to be around fellow believers. I need to be singing with them. I need them to hear me. I need to hear them. I need to hear a word from God. I need to contemplate it. We need to study it. We need to understand it. That's ecclesia. Now, I'm not speaking down to anybody. Perhaps you have not surrendered your life to the Lord. Perhaps you have not followed Him in believer's baptism. I promise you, I've been there. Everybody in here that could say, I'm a believer, we've been there. So I'm saying to you, just listen. See what the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Praise God you're here. But when you hear the word church, it's very difficult in 2023 in the Western world, in America, where there are churches on every corner, buildings on every corner, not necessarily churches. I'm just going to say that. I don't judge anybody. We're constantly judging ourselves to make sure we're as real as we can be with God's help. That's hard work, you know. Can we live in a fallen world? And people are people. You'll see that in just a moment. So when we get to these seven churches, and they comprise what we call chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, there's seven churches there. These are real churches in real time. And John is writing now what he hears. He's writing about his day and time. And these, the whole book of Revelation will first be delivered to these seven churches, and then it will sweep the empire and go to all of the churches, and then down through all of history, right into the pulpit at Hickory Hammock in 2023. Absolutely amazing. Most of it is coming or has come alive only in our generation, as it was meant to be opened directly into 
the very last of the last days. We don't set dates here. Don't panic about that. I don't have a clue when that is. It could be a couple of hundred years from now. It could be this week. It doesn't matter. But I want the Lord to return soon. Don't you get kind of tired of all this mess? The world's going out of its mind. But in the meantime, perfection is on its way. So John writes. When he writes these letters, that brought this book alive to the churches in that time. In fact, these these, these, these seven letters to the seven churches are going to be very pointed. Now, to the church at Ephesus, I write, I say, well, it was a real church, real people, real things going on, a lot of it good, some of it not so good. And the Lord speaks to it. But what we're going to see is, as we go through these seven churches, there's a message here for this group and collection of people that we call Hickerhamic Church, because it's on Hickerhamic Road, so we call it Hickerhamic Church. By the way, next year we will have been a church 100 years. Yeah, 100 years. 1924, a group of people met in homes out here, prayer meeting, and they studied the Word, and they knew they needed to establish a church out here back then, 100 years ago, which was swamps and woods and a dirt road. That was it. And a few houses scattered throughout, and the church was born here. Now, again, I use that word to mean this collection of people who worship under this roof. But anyway, just a little tidbit there for you. So keep this in mind, what is. But the deal is, because this is the Word of God and it's anointed by the Holy Spirit, it also happens to take place that the seven letters to the seven churches come alive for 2,000 years. It speaks to all churches at all times and all generations, and it will speak to us. You will hear you will hear. And more importantly than just than us as a group, it'll speak to you. You'll see. You will see. I'm looking forward to it. Chapter 1, verse 19, write, therefore, what, you, what you've seen, what is now, what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels, and that word in Greek and or Hebrew means messengers. Usually it means messengers of God's throne. They are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches to whom he's going to write. And again, that would literally read, and to the ecclesia, the seven ecclesia, the seven groups of called out ones that are meeting in these locations. That's what it means. It's not about a building, not about a denomination. It's about God's born-again, blood-bought believers. Everybody with me on that so far? Okay. Now we start chapter 2. To the angel, to the messenger of the church in Ephesus, write. And then John wrote. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. That is, these are the words of Jesus Christ himself. He is the head of the church, right? The word of God makes that clear. He is the chief cornerstone. He and the word, and he's the word that becomes flesh. He is the foundation of the ecclesia. We are fellow servants, fellow ministers of his kingdom. But it is him. It is out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says to the church at Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. It says men in some translations. But men, women, the people among you. What you have tested, excuse me, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles. Now, that would apply to the men in the group. But are not and have found them false. That's interesting. We're going to talk about all this. You have persevered and you have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. You understand that so far everything is really good here. I mean, you know, you're a great church. You, you, you don't put up with a bunch of foolishness. You, you can't tolerate uh, wickedness in your midst and you deal with it biblically and lovingly, but you deal with it. Amen? All right. Verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. This is huge, folks, and I'm going to show you where the answer to what this means is in just a few moments. But listen, you have forsaken your first love. Wow. You don't want to hear Jesus say those words. Remember the height from which you have fallen. 
repent. The word repent means, of course, to be contrite, but it also means to turn, turn back, turn from it, turn and go the right way. Repent and do the things you did at first. He says, now, if you do not turn and go the right way, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I love you for this. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, and I do too. Now, you notice he didn't say those who were caught up in it. You hate the practice of it. Separate the sin from the sinner, right? But you understand. You hear it right here. The Lord says you hate that practice. And now, now, we're going to get into all this in a few moments, and I'll show you what it is. I'll give you examples of how that spirit goes through churches and has been in this one, and we're always having to keep our vigilance. That's the work of the church. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then the Lord Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear. That means spiritual. Can you hear my sheep, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10, 10. Are you with me? Do we have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit speaks to us? See, it's Satan that usually screams and twists and manipulates and hollers at us and, and threatens us. It's the sweet presence of God who patiently, quietly speaks in a still, small voice and says, you're stepping out of line, my son, my daughter. Please come back before Satan destroys you. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to say a word. You don't even have to say amen. But I imagine every believer in here has heard something like that from the Holy Spirit. That's why he says, if you have an ear to hear, if you haven't blocked out what God is trying to say, because God is a gentleman. He is a gentleman. He will not trample over you. He will not put a rope around you and tie you and drag you and manipulate you. But he will speak to you. He will love you. Listen, I've got grown children now and grown grandchildren, and I've told them all their lives. I said, I'm going to be a, a dad to you, and I'm going to be a granddad to you, and all that that takes. But even as you come into your adult years, I will not stay on top of you like I did when you were a child because you are your own man. But you know what? Because I love you, if I see you going completely crazy, I'm going to speak to you. And then you do what you want, but I will pray for you, I will love you, and I will speak to you because I love you. And that's how the Lord does it in our life. He will convict us. He will chastise us. He will speak to us. But it's because he adores you. And he wants to do things in your life for you that he can't if you won't listen. That's why he says here to the church at Ephesus, they're a great church. They're doing so many things correctly. But there are a few things that he says, you got to tighten this up. One of them, you're kind of losing your first love. You're going to see what all is involved in that in just a second. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the ecclesia. To him or to her who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in, which is in the paradise of God. Boy, there's a sermon there. I've already preached it. What did Jesus tell the thief on the cross when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? He said, I tell you the truth. This day you will be with me in paradise. That's Greek to English, the Hebrew word that's used here in the Hebrew translation of the New Testament. You will be with me. In Gan Eden. Do you hear what that might, sounds like? You will be with me in the Garden of Eden. What does Jesus say to the church at Ephesus? Where the tree of life still stands. You see, a big dark veil was dropped on the day Adam and Eve chose Satan over the throne of God. They believed his lies. A veil was dropped. Cherubim guarded the Word of God tells us. It's holy. It's unbelievable. It's another dimension. But what did Jesus promise? That contrite, broken, repented thief when he said, Lord. You know what he called him? 
Adonai. That means God in the flesh, God with us, the Lord. Lord, Adonai. He's making a profession of faith. Please remember me. He's broken. He's repentant. When you come into your kingdom, he's acknowledging you're the one. You're the Messiah. You're God in the flesh. And for all that to happen, you must return. And you must establish your kingdom. He said a mouthful in those little words that we hear on church and Sunday school sometimes. And we think, oh, isn't that sweet? He was so, he was so sweet. He was really hurting. He, Lord, remember me. You know, if there's, no, no, no. He was praying a prayer of salvation. Adonai, remember me. I know who you are. And I know you're coming. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember me when you come into that kingdom. And then Jesus said, you don't even have to wait that long. Before this day is over, when you draw your last breath, I'm going to take you through the veil, and you will be in Gan Eden with me. That's why the Apostle Paul, who tasted of that, was caught up, would later say to the church, I long to be absent from this body now and present with the Lord. I went through the veil. I've seen it. You'll see in Revelation chapter 4, John goes through the veil right into the throne room of God. We'll get to that in a few Sundays. All of this ties together. That's the letter to the church at Ephesus. Now I want to give you a couple of definitions of some words, and then we're going to turn to another book in the Bible that will lay out some of these mysteries or these mysterious words in great detail and then it starts to get very very personal for all of us all of us you hear me use the word us okay these are the words of him go back to verse uh, verse one who holds the seven stars in his right hand walks among the seven golden lampstands jesus is among us when we're praising his name i know your deeds he knows our deeds he knows our thoughts your hard work your perseverance those are things that bless his heart know that you can i know that you cannot tolerate wickedness among you that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false listen to me that's a very interesting concept Sometimes we can skip right over that and say, well, these are the false teachers. Well, yeah, that, they probably were doing that. But more than that, they started off with a false testimony. An apostle, the purest definition of that word means one who originally walked with the Lord Jesus and or saw him and or witnessed what he did. The, uh, the apostle Paul was not necessarily with him, although he might have been in some of the crowds because the Pharisees dogged Jesus all over the empire for th or were all over Judea and Galilee for three years. Paul might have been among them. But he certainly was there when the church was born. The Bible says that. So he was a witness, not only an eyewitness perhaps of the things Jesus did, but an eyewitness of the birth of the church by the Holy Spirit at the mouth and promise of Jesus. Then as he was persecuting Christians, the resurrected Christ appeared to him, knocked him down in the sight of witnesses. Three days he grappled with what he was going to do with this. How does he deal with this situation? Does he renounce everything he has worked for? Will his family renounce? him? Yes. You've heard Zeph Parat. <laughs> his whole family renounced him. Uh, will friends and family? Yes. Will he lose his job and his position in that case? Uh, yes. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He grapples with it for three days. God does a lot of amazing things in three days, doesn't he? And on the third day, he surrendered his life. And from that point forward, he was known by the church or sometime a little bit later as he was introduced to the church as an apostle to the church. Why? Because he was an eyewitness. All right, now watch. So here's Ephesus. This is sometime later. This is decades later after all that. And there are people coming into the church that are representing themselves as apostles. Now, there are still a lot of original believers that are alive. It's not just the first 12. I mean, the first 12 are the ones that started the church or, you know, Peter, James, and John. They were, they were the first pastors of the first church, church Acts, excuse me, Acts chapter 2. Y'all have to forgive me. I did an interview this morning. It was a global interview from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Yeah, I know. And I really would like for you to feel sorry for me. <laughs> but you won't. See, you laugh at me. So if I stumble over my words, because you know I never do that. I'm going to blame it on that this morning, all right? <laughs> but watch. <laughs> so this is interesting to me. I hope this is interesting to you. But 
they were coming to the church at Ephesus and they were saying, I'm an apostle. I was there. I saw it. I was a part of the crowd that followed him all the time. I saw the miracles. I saw this and that. Okay, well, that's cool. The early church valued that. This was eyewitness testimony so that as the word is preached, we can look and say, you were there, weren't you? You were there. I do that a lot. I've been here a long time. And so when I talk about things that have happened in the past here, I'm even going to do that this morning. Hang on. Um, I, I, I will often say some of you were there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm not lying. I know it sounds weird to, to people that are guests, but it's helpful to have apostles <laughs> here right people who are there and can see it that's why oftentimes i'll turn to my wife right in the middle of service and say am i telling the truth and she knows she can say well baby you got that a little bit skewed there but but i always check it in my mind before i ask her because she's that honest but but this is what i'm saying so the people were coming to the church at ephesus you know, you know, and they were claiming we're apostles and he says but you have tested them and you have found some of them to be false what what's that about it's about ego, pride, power, and fame. Ephesus was probably the largest church in that whole region. It was a mega church in its day. John was the pastor of it and kind of the bishop of all the other churches. He had trained up some of those pastors. He was helping them to understand the word. He was an apostle. He was John, a teenager when Jesus called him. He'd been through the whole thing including the island of Patmos until Domitian was overthrown and they released the prisoners and John went back home and eventually died in his own house on his own bed, entered into the presence of God, into the presence of Jesus. But the point is they tested the apostles. We don't know how. It doesn't say. I guess like John who was really there when the man's eyes were opened with spit and mud. You remember that sermon? So he might have asked him, you remember the blind man back in, back in Jerusalem and, and Jesus, Jesus opened his eyes? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. How did he do it? Oh, well, he just spoke and they wrote, you're not an apostle, you're a fake. Because you would remember what he did that day. And you would know why. Is everybody following me? All right, so I'm, I don't want to belabor this, but this, this is interesting to me. There were people coming in saying, I want me some of that. Put me on the program. Put me on the stage. Right? That happens. It'll happen. It'll happen. Guys, I'm just going to break in and tell you this. Some of you that were in my studies, uh, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago when we were doing all that, you heard me tell some of these stories. I'm going to tell some here this morning for the sake of our live stream uh, congregation and, and for the sake of these that are guests and for some of you that are newer in the church. As I'm speaking now, my wife and I, because of your graciousness, we have been here 36 years as your pastor and pastor's wife. What I'm going to tell you, there are witnesses here to this. And or if they didn't hear it, they know I went straight to them and told them. Some of the church leadership, et cetera, and, and people that were here. And my wife, of course, as always, can tell you I'm getting ready to tell you the truth. But what I'm going to tell you is kind of weird. Several things I'll tell you this morning are kind of weird if you've never heard anything like this. But this is what Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus. A great church, a powerful church, a strong church, a sweet church. You heard him say that right up front. Right up front. He, con he commended them. Over my years here, I have had folks who have come into this church, usually a guest or a visitor or somebody that's been for a, f a couple of years. Sometimes it's people that are from the area that have come and been here for a few months. But in the conversation after church, we're talking and everything, and then they will say, listen, the Lord has spoken to me, and he wants me to tell you something. Now, listen, I listen to that, but I don't just fall all down and go, oh, yes, give me a word, give me a word. I'm smarter than that. But I've had people speak words over me that have come to pass, and they were biblical when they spoke them, and they sounded biblical, and they wanted nothing for themselves. They just spoke a word, and I thought, I don't know how that's going to happen, but it did. And that's the spirit of prophecy, and God gives that. But you've got to test it, right? This is what the Holy Spirit, this is what Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus. You test. You test these things, and you have found some to be false, and that is good. See, you're protecting your church. Amen? Amen. I've had them come, and I've had them say, the Lord's given me a word for you, and I'll, I'll listen. And then they will say, next Sunday, I need to be up there preaching. Am I lying? 
isn't that weird? Three or four times, maybe more in 35 years. Not, not often, as you can do the math, once every six or seven years. But out of the clear blue, it's usually somebody I've never seen before. My sweet answer is, well, he hasn't spoken that to me yet. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Did you hear me? Those are my sweet words. <laughs> because sometimes they press the point to where I just have to say, ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Yeah, but God told me, well, he's got to tell me. And now that you've acted this way, he's got to kick me in the teeth. <sighs> Do you see how relevant this word is? That's Ephesus 2,000 years ago. Living in the first century when Jesus went to the cross, when he rose from the dead, when the church was born. Some of the people then were in their 30s or 40s or 50s, and maybe they've passed now by the time this is written. But a lot of them were younger, and they were there. First-generation Christians are still in the church. Second-generation Christians, their children are still in the church. And it's still going on. People are coming in, claiming things about themselves in order to get a microphone and to feel important. Jesus warned about that. Even when he was on the face of the earth teaching in parables to his disciples and followers, he would say, look, when the kingdom of heaven begins to grow, and he, and he gives all the, the parable of the mustard seed. It's the little teeny seed, but it grows and becomes this big thing. And mustard plants don't become like this tree. But he tells this because he's speaking of the last days of the denominational branches and the growth of big, big, huge organization, almost government kind of churches and people that leaders that bow down to everything the government says. And Jesus warns, he says, and so, so in those days, he said, here's what's going to happen. The kingdom of heaven will advance forcefully, the true kingdom of heaven. But forceful men will always be there trying to grab hold of it. Does that make sense to you now? That verse never made sense to me until I became a preacher, until I became a pastor. And, and came, not, I'm going to say here because this is the only church I've ever pastored, but it could be anywhere. It happens all over the place. Some pastors in leadership cave. We'll talk about that later. But, but, but that's what's happening here at Ephesus. But they passed that test. So far at Hickory Hammock, we've passed it here. And I don't just do this alone, Ranger. Now, this is why I can say some of you know what I'm talking about because I get people around me, leadership around me, deacons around me, godly men and women in the church, let them know what's going on, tell them to help me look out for this and to stay on top of it because it happens. And it was happening when the church started. You know what that is? Here's the kingdom of God. And right in the middle of it, Satan's going to show up. He's going to try. He's going to do it in your life. He's going to do it wherever God's people, the ecclesia, gather together to move the kingdom forward. Is everybody with me? This is important stuff, guys. But anyway, okay. And then we come down to this, to this verse 6. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, let me just say what this is. There are several different versions of this you'll hear in the churches. There's one called the practice of Balaam that comes out of the Old Testament. I'll get in more detail when we get there. There's another one called, and that Jezebel you have among you. That also comes out of the Old Testament. That's very closely related to this. I'll get to that in more specific detail when we get to that church. But the deal is, the spirit of the Nicolaitans is mentioned in two churches. The first time we hear it is here. We have writings from the earliest days of the early church in which historians were beginning to write outside of the New Testament documents, which are the ultimate history of what happened. But we've got writings of historians. Either they're speculating biblically or they just they know what they're talking about because they've heard people talk about it like me. I'm preaching about this this morning. And you go home, maybe tell, tell a friend or a next-door neighbor, and then they tell somebody. And then so it just people know what I said and what, what used to happen or what has happened out here. So either those guys knew this specifically or they were speculating biblically. But here's what most of them say. This Nicolaitans, that term is only used twice in the book of Revelation and it's not used anywhere else in the Bible. But back in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, you can turn there if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, it's when the first deacons of the first church were selected. And there is a list of names. 
one of the deacons is called Nicholas, who was a convert to Judaism. In other words, he was a Gentile, had become a Jew, not by heritage and DNA, but by religion somewhere in the mix of his life. But then comes the Messiah, and then comes the crucifixion, then comes the resurrection, then comes the birth of the church. Now he's in the church. He's apparently pretty well known by the pastors and the people to be a fairly good man, and so they ask him to be a deacon. Now, that's not necessarily a badge of, we're going to get a group of men that are going to run the church. That's not what deacons are supposed to do. They're supposed to be servants. That's what the word means in Greek, diakonos. I mean, he's just ministering to the body, ministering to the pastors, coming alongside the pastors, helping them minister. A very honorable thing. It should not be a power position. And a lot of churches in America have made it that way, and it has destroyed a lot of churches. But the early historians say that this term Nicolaitan came from that dude, Nicholas. You never hear anything else about him in the New Testament, so it's possible. There's a strong possibility what I'm getting ready to tell you from the scholars and the historians is correct. If it's not, at least the spirit of this was. They say as if they know or have heard or understand or have evidence of that it was this guy who got enamored with himself and the badge he had and the power he thought he had. And he began to lord it over the people in the church as well as the pastors and the other servants of God. The spirit of Nicolaitan, of the Nicolaus. And they said that he also, this is in historical writing, set himself up as a teacher and began to teach false teachings, bringing in other teachings to the point that he actually was teaching that certain forms of sexual immorality were okay with God. I'm glad we don't hear that in the churches today, aren't y'all? Isn't this crazy? I mean, you think, wow, way back then they were doing, it's the same demon, the same Satan who's been here all in our, as far as earthly uh, terms go, forever. I mean, not, you know, God's the only one forever, but I mean, he was created even before us. He's been around a long time. He doesn't have to change his tactics. We're like fish in the ocean. He knows what lures to throw out, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you know, so... This is something that was coming against the church at Ephesus. Well, if it's a good church, a strong church, a church that's blowing and going, that kind of stuff will come. False teaching. Sexual immorality that's not dealt with. Power plays. We don't tell the preacher what to do. Well, that's okay. Preacher needs to hear, but in a godly way from godly people. And, but to tell the preacher. Now, listen, you can't, don't preach that no more. I don't like that. The spirit of Nicolaitis. Bless your hearts, there are a lot of pastors under that in America. They are under it. You might have come from places like that. I grew up in a couple of churches like that. Let me tell you. For those of you that have been in my teaching on this, please forgive some of these illustrations that you will hear again for the second or third time. But again, I'm speaking to folks that have never heard any of this. They need to know this stuff is real. And you have to battle it all the time, not only in your own life, but in the church that you're going to be a part of and you're going to support. And you want it to stay as, as real as possible before the Lord. When I came here 36 years ago, I'd only been here about a year. Church was really doing well, as it has for all these years one way or the other. But it was really doing well. And it was coming out of a little bit of a slump. A lot of good people were here. A lot of good people. And I loved, fell in love with them. And they seemed to love me and my wife. And we went on. And either y'all still do or y'all are crazy because we're still here. <laughs> but I mean, way back then. Now, the sanctuary we're in now, we still call it the new sanctuary. Help me. Help me. How long? You can, <laughs> Brandy and Eric were the first people I married in this sanctuary. Uh, and by the way, your daughter reminded me of this. So if you don't like what I'm doing, it's her. Okay. But we were talking about it because last Sunday I was talking about, I can't remember how old this sanctuary is, but the first wedding that almost right after we opened it, they were the first ones that we did here. How long ago was that? 29 years, 29 years. Most of us still call this the new sanctuary. 
Man, well, when your preacher's been here 36 years, you know, and we started over next door was the fellowship hall. But the point is, that was the sanctuary of them. None of this was here. This was just a part of the parking lot area and everything that went that way. And so we had a work day up here one Saturday. And I was working on that wall, let's say, because it joins over there, outside. And there was something that had to be, well, basically I was busting rocks. I don't remember what it was. We were having to tear up a big something over there and having to replace some, I don't know if it was infrastructure or some foundational work or something. And other people were mowing grass. Other people were trimming. Other people were hauling stuff to the garbage and back and forth to the dump. And so I was out there by myself, and I said, I'll handle that. So I went over there, and I was literally busting rocks. And this guy that was here back then, not going to give hints, not going to say names, people that were here know who I'm talking about. He addled up to me while we were working. I promise you, I went straight to the church leadership after and straight to my wife. I am not lying. This is going to sound strange to you. This is just a part of what you're reading here. He came up to me, but I'm busting rocks. And I'm nasty, and I'm sweaty, and I'm tired, but I'm still busting. And he comes up and says, Preacher, I need to talk to you just a minute. I said, okay, brother, what's on, what's on your mind? He said, do you know who the most powerful person in the kingdom is? I'm thinking, what an odd question. And I said something. I don't remember exactly, but I remember the gist of it. It was like, brother, I don't have time for parables. Can you just get to the point? I don't want to guess and play mind games. What do you mean? Do I know who the most powerful? I don't know. What, what? He said, the most powerful person in the kingdom is not the king. It's the king maker. And I'm the king maker of this church. You might be the king here for a little bit. And I remember saying something. Well, brother, I always thought Jesus was the king of the church. You know? I mean, I, mean, I said that. And then I said, but whatever. I said, I don't think there's any king makers. He said, oh. Please understand, I'm the king maker. All right, now there's a whole story to that. If you come to Bible study tonight, I'll tell you the backstory if you want. But the bottom line is, that is a part of the spirit of Nicolaitan. I want, I can't be the king, and I'm not the king here, but you know, that's how people think. I can't be the king, so I want to get to tell the king what to do. I'm the king maker, and I was here before you got here, and don't forget that. Do you understand that evil spirit? That's demonic. This is what the church at Ephesus, they didn't tolerate it. Jesus says to them, you hate that spirit, and I hate it too. And not only that, but that Nicolaitan, probably that Nicholas, was also now had risen to the point where he was very involved in the teaching and then was going askew and even winking as certain forms of sexual immorality saying, trying to justify them by the word of God. Unbelievable. All right. Now, has everybody got this picture? Overall, good church, big church, the church that John had pastored before he goes to the island of Patmos. Um, they, they, they've stood their ground. They've, they've really held on to things. But the two things, well, well, the one big thing, excuse me, the one big thing was, but you've lost your first love. You've lost your first love. You're losing it. What? Man, we're doing all this work. We're doing all these good things. We're, boy, we're testing those that claim to be apostles. We're, we don't put up with false teaching. And this spirit of Nicola, Nicolaus, we're a Nicolaitan spirit that pops up all the time. We're standing against that. And bro, I'm telling you, that's hard work of the ministry, guys. I'm telling you. And I'm not asking anybody. I feel sorry. That's what you call me for. And, and the leadership that's around me, the pastors and deacons and just good godly men and women that come around the pastors in those kind of times. So I'm not asking for that. I'm just saying that's the hard work of the ministry because look I'm a nice guy <laughs> I, am, I, am, I don't like to go around and you know spit in people's faces and start a fight and all of that I just I just, just not me even when I was a cop I wasn't that way and I like to have peace if at all possible but not peace at any cost are you following me as a cop, I was a peacekeeper, but when somebody shot at me, I shot back, and that happened four different times in my career. But the point is, when it happens here, I don't just jump in somebody's face. I don't, I don't look to slap them down. We try to get it right, but sometimes people just won't let you. And sometimes they got a demonic spirit in them. I'm not saying they're demon-possessed. I'm saying they just got a demonic spirit hovering over them and surrounding them. And then the work of the ministry gets hard. 
Because a lot of times they leave, they get mad, they go throughout the community lying and trashing and slandering. And then how, how do you deal with that? Here's how you deal with it. You just keep going for, for the Lord and vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. All of those people that used to do that kind of stuff, they're gone. I'm still here. You're still here. Hickory Hammock is still here. We're all over the world ministering. Okay, everybody got that? All right, but now watch. But now what is this about the first love? You know what's cool about this letter to the church at Ephesus? We have a book in the New Testament called Ephesians. The letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Wait till you hear some of this. Go to chapter 4 of Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians. Watch this. This is really cool. Okay, I'm going to do this quick, but watch. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul is writing. We're going to find out about this first love thing. You're not going to hear the term first love, but you're going to hear him talk a lot about love and what's happening and what they need to do and what's going on and what they need to guard against. And this is probably 10, 20, 15 years before John would write um, uh, the book of Revelation. So Paul is writing to that church at Ephesus that he helped to get start and to train his leadership. Chapter 4, verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord then, that means he's serving the Lord with all of his life now. He's captivated, captive of the Lord and not Satan anymore, not the world. That's why he calls himself a prisoner. Then I urge you, you at Ephesus, you believers at Ephesus, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Why would he say that? Because some of them weren't. That's why. If they were all living the life worthy of what God had called them, he wouldn't have had to say that. But he said it, and watch, it gets deeper. Be completely humble and gentle. That's the total opposite of the Nicolaitan spirit. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. In other words, we're all here. This is not a collection of perfect people. We're a collection of imperfect people. Did you hear me say we are? We're bought by the blood. We still have our flesh. The Holy Spirit intervenes and helps us. We're walking a journey together, but none of us are perfect. But we're not called to perfection each day so much as we are called to what? Direction. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Just keep going for him. So, so Paul writes and he says, so, so be patient, be humble, be gentle. That's opposite of Nicolaitan. And bear with one another. Understand these, everybody, we're like each other in so many ways. And do it in love. And make every effort to keep the bond of unity of the Holy Spirit through the bond of peace. And there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. That is, it, you shouldn't be all splintered up. And, well, I follow this and I follow that and I do this. And I do this. One God, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one profession of faith. Let's serve him in love with as much patience as we can muster. And if we can't, let's get somebody to help us and let's pray about it. Amen? Amen. All right, keep going. But to each one of us, grace has been given. Have you ever heard the song Amazing Grace? That's what Paul's talking about. As Christ apportioned it. Now, these next verses sound a little odd, and I've preached on it deeply, and it comes alive when I do, but I don't have time, but I'm still going to read it in context. And that's why it says, and he's speaking of the scriptures, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train. He gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? In other words, he's talking about how he came from the throne of God, left it put on flesh, and came among us down here on the earth or through that portal in here on earth. That's what it means. Ascended to the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens which he did after the resurrection in order to fill the whole universe. Verse 11. Now it was he, that's Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. All of this to prepare God's people, the ecclesia, for works of service. And I'm going to add to the kingdom so that the body of Christ may be built up until we finally all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God 
and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Listen, that won't happen in its completeness until we are with the Lord because the Bible says then we will know him as he is. Then we will know everything as it is. Then we will be completely changed, completely mature. Our minds made new, everything made new. But in the meantime, this is boot camp. Is everybody with me? This is where we're learning the basics, and then we move on to some of the finer details of warfare. Brother Carl, why are you going to talk about that in church? Because Paul does in Ephesians 6. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against spirits of wickedness in the unseen realms, in high places of power. That's where our battle is, suit up in the armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you can take your stand. This is warfare, guys. A part of what we're doing this morning is just training for warfare. And we're reminding ourselves as an ecclesia, a called out body of people, we're reminding ourselves of the hard work of ministry. And that doesn't just involve, well, we paid a preacher to do all that. Well, you better be a part of it with me or we're going to be in a mess. I mean, I'll take my place of leadership. I will. I'll even go down, throw down, be cop on you if you want me to. I know how to do that. I know how to read you your rights and everything else, but I'd rather do it in peace and love if you'll let me. But the bottom line is together, we've got to be as real of a church as possible. Why? So we can be all comfortable here? No. So that when those doors open and a hurting soul comes in here dragging the filth of the world in their life, but they want relief, they want healing, they want salvation, they want deliverance, they can find it here. Because it's a place of peace. And give the Lord a hand and power and anointing. It's a place that's sanctified, a place that has some sanctity and sanity in it. Out those doors, there's not much of that. That's why. Yeah, you've called me to be the pastor. I will be a strong leader. I will take the sword, get on the horse, and lead the charge. I will be out front. I won't be hiding in a closet somewhere. But we need all to do these things. Paul is telling the church at Ephesus, it takes all of you. It takes all of you. Now, verse 14, then, watch this. If you'll do this, he says, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Good gosh, y'all look at me. Isn't our culture filled with that now? Forget culture. Isn't our world filled with that now? Cunning, deceitful, lying, twisting, throwing truth to the ground. Follow the science. When a lot of times the science is a lie. And I'm not even talking about the latest thing we just went through. I'm talking, I'm talking about science all the way back to we came from a big explosion of nothing. I mean, I mean the wickedness is thick. And it's in churches. Over the years, we've had to deal with the literature that we were using, buying literature from what used to be good, good, solid things to use in our, uh, our, our we called it Sunday school then, but our morning Bible study. And, and good gosh, there were evolution teachings in some of that stuff, trying to blend the evolution and the Bible. We got rid of it, we, you know, people got mad, left the church, because no, no, that's the science. Are y'all following me? That's just one example. Paul saying, man, you got to stand up to this false teaching. What did, this, what did Jesus say to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2? And you can't tolerate. You, you, you work hard at that. And he says, you can't tolerate these wicked people and the Nicolaitan spirit and the false teaching, sexual immorality, and then just false teacher and false apostles. People say, I was an apostle. I was there when he opened the eyes of the blind man in Jerusalem. Really? How did he do it? He just spoke to him. Really? He didn't do anything physical? Nothing physical. I was there. You failed. Eh, wrong. You're not an apostle. You weren't there. You see what I'm saying? It's hard work of ministry. Who wants to do that? Who wants to tell somebody they're making something up? It's hard to do, isn't it? But for the sake of the sanctity and sanity and purity and power of the church, it has to be done. Sweetly, if people will let us. If they won't let us do it sweetly, we'll, do it. we'll dance the dance they want to dance. But we're not going to compromise who we are as the ecclesia. Does that make sense? Give the Lord a hand there. All right. Now watch. So Paul's talking about that. Watch. All right. So, so he goes on in verse 15. He says, so instead, speaking the truth in love. How many times have we said that? 
People in the world make fun of us. Yeah, 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 that's your little cliche for saying what you want to say. Well, some people can use it that way. But truly, it's a command from God's Word. Speak the truth. We know what a marriage is here, y'all. We know what a gender is. We know what a little boy and a little girl is. We know what a man is. We know what a woman is. There's no doubt about it. We know what the Word of God says about all manner of sexual sin. We know that. We speak it. We speak it in love. We know what the womb is, and we know how important that is. We know a lot of people are hurting because of that whole thing that's been bought by our culture. But we speak the truth of all of that, but we speak it in a spirit of love by saying, but if you're here to get it all right with the Lord, if you're here just to be healed, if you're here to be delivered from the lies you've been told, you have come to a safe place, a loving place, a non-judgmental place. If you're coming for the right reason, welcome. Right? That's the work of the church. That's what Paul's telling the church at Ephesus here. And he's, guard, he's telling me, you've got to guard this. Otherwise, you're not the church. Otherwise, you don't have a lampstand. Look at verse 17. So I'll tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that we must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Why would he say that? Because some of them were. Gentiles there means unbelievers. Because not all the people in the church at Ephesus were Jewish people. So, but that's a, that's a word that's thrown around. Uh, to, to mean unbelievers, the nations. He said, we can't, we can't do this. We can't do it anymore. Not in the church. No, 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 no. He says, they are, they, they, in the futility of their thinking, says these people that are unbelievers, and some of them, he implicated, were even masquerading as believers. They are darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God. That means in Jesus Christ. Because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They've lost all sensitivity they have given themselves over to sexual sin, sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Good gosh, could you describe our world spirit any more than that? And what did the angel say to the church at Ephesus? You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. And so do I. What did it involve? Lording it over. The leadership, the pastor. Boy, if you can get the pastor and say, I own him. I'm the kingmaker. Then you got power. At least you think you do. But it doesn't even have to be that. It's just, I run this committee and I run that and I own this and I own that. And this is my class. Nobody else can have them. This is mine. I'm going to do it my way. I'm my, 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 my. So there's all that. Then there's false teaching. Then there's justification for sin that usually they're involved in. Only one amen, but you understand. I mean, that's a hard pill to swallow. People start justifying sin through the scriptures. You can bet they're either involved in it or somebody they love, bless their heart, has broken their heart, and so they're trying to justify it. That's the hard work of the ministry. You want to tell them the truth in love. You don't want to crush them. You don't want to destroy them. So, but this is, this is it. And, 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 and then... This stuff was going on in the church at Ephesus. Now, I wasn't infested by it, but Paul's saying, why would he say these things if it wasn't a problem in the Christian community, in the churches, maybe even in this church? By the time we get to Revelation, they're commended for standing against that, but it's the hard work of the ministry, and they got to do it all the time. You cannot let your guard down. Is everybody following me? All right, here we go. <laughs> verse, 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 uh, verse 29. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him. You were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put it off. Your old self was being corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. People were lying on each other. And speak truthfully to his neighbor. Some people were lying to each other. For we are all members of one body. And in your anger, do not sin. It's okay to be angry. That's a human emotion. But don't let that anger get a hold of you and cause you to do something that only Satan would rejoice in. Do not let the sun go down on you while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. That's one of the things we work so hard. We don't try to break it down into, all right, we got to deal with sexual sin this week. We got to deal with false teaching this week. We got to deal with the Nicolaitan spirit of lording over that. No, no, no. We just, we just are always looking to not let Satan get a foothold. 
this is not a cult. I don't look in your windows. We don't come tell you how to live. We preach the word. We minister to each other. We're loving to each other as much as we can. We are not required, listen to this, anywhere in the Bible to like each other. Isn't that good? Some of y'all don't like me. Back at you. All I mean by that is, is there a thing, you know, everybody's got something about them. You say, I don't, I don't really care for that much. Oh, okay, okay. But you know what? If we're under one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, in a church, we're doing the work of the church, not the work of who we like and who we don't. This is not a social media platform where we get like, 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 I don't like you. I don't like you. Like, 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 like. No, this is a place where we are commanded, love each other. What does that mean? It means look out for each. You give the Lord a hand. What does that mean? It means looking out for the good of each other. Why? For the sake of the sanity and the sanctity of the church. Why? So that more hurting people can come. More people can be saved. More people can be delivered. More people can be healed. The church, the ecclesia, God knows the Lord Jesus. He said, I know your thoughts. I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. I'm standing among you. I'm in your midst. Amen. Listen, I could go on and on. Let's just reflect very quickly back on Revelation chapter 2, the church at Ephesus. If you want to know more, just go to the teachings I've got, carlgals.com slash rev, and just go, we, I go deeper because I you know, would have several hours each night to talk, and we got some deep stuff. But yeah, you've got the point here. But listen, so we're talking about the church at Ephesus, the ecclesia. But again, that's not a building. That's not a denomination. What is it? It's a, a group of people who are saying, we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are born again. Even that, we, without being judgmental and we don't look in people's windows, we still have to kind of test that along the way, each other, kind of make sure that we're genuine or maybe if we've stumbled and failed, we go lovingly and try to help them out. All those things. This is the hard work of the church. But we've got to do that to keep the purity and the strength and the anointing and the power here so that hurting people coming out of a crazy, deranged world can find a place of sanity and healing and salvation and forgiveness and an overall non-judgmental attitude. We don't wink at the sin, but we love the sinner. And we help them out of it so they can live in victory. Here's the point. The church, the ecclesia at Ephesus, they were good. They fought continually to do what we're doing. But they were losing their first love. You just read it. That is just... Stay right, stay pure, keep your eye on the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing. That's why, that's why our, sun, our, our Sunday morning worship services, you hear me all the time say, lift up his name, exalt his name, lift up his word. I'm going to pray over you in the word. Agree with this word. What am I doing? I'm keeping the main thing, the main thing. Student ministries, children's ministries, senior adult ministries, young adult ministries, chain breaker classes. Yes, uh, from hope to, for, I mean, from hurt to hope kind of a grief ministry. We've got all of that. All these things are super important, all of them. And we pray that all of them are infused with the main thing that's the main thing. But every Lord's Day, the focus here is we exalt the name of Jesus. We exalt his word. We stand in faith. We walk in faith. When we stumble and we fall, we get up. We put our eyes back on the Lord. We keep going. We help each other. When a brother or sister is stumbling along the way, we come along beside, pick them up, grab them by the elbow, and help them, right? Because there may be a time when you're stumbling along the way, and you'd love it if a loving brother or sister did that for you, wouldn't you? What is that being? We're standing in our first love. We found the Lord Jesus Christ. He blessed us. He delivered us. He healed us. He saved us. He has anointed us. He gives us gifts. He shows us his word. It's coming alive. Don't you want to keep all that, guys? Don't you want that in your life? See, when we say church, it's you, 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 me. It's, it's individuals. We collected together this morning to hear this word together, to let the Holy Spirit move among us, to praise him, to exalt Jesus. But it's about you and your relationship with Jesus. 
It is about me and my relationship with Jesus. It's about us and our relationship with Jesus. Why? Because this world is in darkness, and we are now the light representing the kingdom that is to come. And that light in the Revelation is called a lampstand. He tells Ephesus, if you don't get back to your first life, you can do all these good things. But if you're not exalting my name, if you're not standing in the word in context and exalting that word, if you're not doing missions and ministry and getting your hands dirty in the work of ministry and other people's lives, you're losing your first love. And if that ever disappears from this church, he says, I will go on the lampstand. Because now you've just become an institutional organization doing good things rather than the body of Christ, the ecclesia, who exalts the name of Yeshua HaMashiach to the world and stands in that word in love. That's the power. That's the anointing. Your first love. A pastor, a preacher, a teacher, a deacon can lose it. Church people can lose it. A choir member can lose it. A missionary can lose it. But God is gracious. He is gentle. He's kind. He's, he's patient. But he speaks and he says, but if you have an ear to hear, you can get it right and come back. But if you've blocked it all out, he said, oh, I'm not necessarily going to take away your salvation. You know, that's not if you once saved, always saved, if you're really born again. But you can still get immersed in the muck of the world. And the Lord says, I don't know about you, but I want to be under the anointing. I want to be under his power. I want to continue to see him do miraculous things. I said continue because he does in our midst all the time. One day I'm going to go through a list of things that have happened over the last several years, right up to the last few weeks. They're astounding when I think about them. I don't want to lose that. Help me keep the first love strong here. In the meantime, you know what happens? The hard work of the ministry. The hard work of the ministry. Nicolaitan spirit, it can be here. Jezebel spirit, it can come. The Balaam spirit, it can come. People having false pretenses of why they're here and what they want to do, that can come. We want to love them through it. We want to hopefully get them to see the right path and to take the right path and to come to Jesus. But if they don't, guess what? If they're ugly about it, we got to put them out until they get right. That's what the Bible says. In the meantime, this has got to be a place of some kind of holy sanctity in Jesus' name. Here. What the Spirit says to the churches. He or she who has an ear to hear, hear what he says to the ecclesia. Do you hear? Bow your heads with me. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and, you know, you speak of, for example, Internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.